Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad to be born again? Amen. Amen. I am, I'm so glad that we serve a true and living God. I know I'm, I may say that a lot, but I remind myself there are people that serve dead or false gods, whether it's through Buddhism, whether it's through Islam, whether it's through all these other things. We know that they, what they serve is not real and is dead. But yet we serve a true and living God, or at least we claim that we do as Christians. So if we know that God is alive and well, we should act like He's alive and well in our life. Not only do we stir ourselves up in our most holy faith or build ourselves up in our most holy faith, but we also live a lifestyle that says, my God could come back at any moment in time and I'm ready for it. So that means that we should not stay the same at all. We should ever be changing, walking out our faith and fear and trembling of God, walking out our salvation, but knowing that we are serving God and He's alive and well, watching everything that we do, that He's not only that, but He's with us. And that every step that we take, He's with us. He has not left us nor forsake us. He's seen the good and the bad that we do. He sees everything about us. But that also should stir us up to say, you know what, I'm not going to be the same like yesterday. I'm not going to be the same like I was a year ago. So I guess a question this morning, you can turn to Matthew 25 while you're kind of pondering this in your heart, in your spirit, man. How much have you changed since I've been pastor here? How much have you changed within the last year? How much have you changed within the last five years? Not just of losing weight or saving money or how much debt you have or things like that. How much have you changed for God? Because that's what really counts. Losing weight, yeah, that's a good thing. Saving money, that's a good thing. Paying off your debt, that's a good thing. But when it comes down to it, those things will not get you into heaven. Those things don't matter eternally. What does matter is that you're not staying the same in your Christian walk. Because if, let, let's say if Miss Tiffany and I are walking, and all of a sudden I stop and she keeps going, there's going to be a distance between her and I. That distance is not good for me because I'm the one that's falling behind. The same goes with our walk with God. When God is not going to stop and, and wait on you to get things right with Him to, because you want to play with sin. God's not going to stop in the walk to allow you to be distracted by other things or just because you feel uncomfortable like you don't feel like walking today. God's not going to stop for that. God's going to expect you, come on, come on, let's go, let's go. God's going to keep moving because as we approach these, the end of these last days, which we are in, God's not going to wait. God's not going to say, well, all right, all right, Jesus, go get my children. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So-and-so's not ready. Better wait. That's not, that's not what's going to happen. He's going he's to say, go get my children. And they're going to answer, they're going to have to answer for that moment in time of where they stand with God. So our theme for 2022 is call to arms. A call to arms. A call to not be the same. Because when you're in you know, relaxed mode, when you're in kind of stagnant mode, or in the military we would be kind of you know, you know, maybe hanging around the bay or things of that nature, and we were uh, just kind of resting or however you want to say it, then all of a sudden we get a call that we are, you know, somebody stands up and they give out a call. We'll say call to arms for, our, for what we're aiming at here. When they give out that call, everybody comes running to stand in line, and they're ready. They're at attention. They're ready to move at the next order. So that call to arms for us means that we're ready to move when God says move. We're not having to, oh, wait a minute, let me, get my, let me get my stuff together. Let me get my act together, and then we'll go. We're ready to move when He says move. So this is a year of change for us. We're not to be the same. So Matthew 25, we're going to start at verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of God... Then, excuse me. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of, and five of them were wise and five were foolish. Now I will say with this, the Jewish custom that we are missing here, 
because we're, we're Americans. We, sometimes we don't get the Jewish custom or what they're doing. But Jesus is telling this parable, and for their understanding, on the wedding day, the bride and the groom, the, the groom would be at his house, and what he would do is he would, he would go to the bride's house, and he would, get, he would get her together, and then he would walk her back to his house, which would be their house now, because they're married. But along the way, because it would be nighttime, they would have virgins on both sides with their lamps. Now, this is not like the you know, candlestick, like a little candle with the wick, but it's that lamp that has oil in it. And so they would stand on each side and light the way for them to walk by to get to the new house. All right, so this is the picture that's being painted here. It's what Jesus is talking about. So you've got, you know, the virgins are in a line. So you can almost say that if, they, if it wasn't that long of a span, they could have five on each side or ten in a row, however you want to paint that. But they're walking from one house to the other. But I notice that the picture that's painted is the groom, which we know is Jesus Christ, is coming back to get his bride, which is the the, the Christians, the body of Christ, or we say the people of Christ. Now, the bride of Christ is not just here now. The bride of Christ is for all of those that have lived for God, all of those that serve God, whether past or present. So when we say, I try to be careful how I use that term, the bride of Christ, because it's not just for us now, but it's for all of those that have served. That's why when the rapture happens, the graves are going to open up, things are going to take place where it's everybody that has served God is all meeting Jesus Christ in the air to come back with him. So with that, when he goes, when the when the groom goes to get his bride, you know, they're waiting for him to walk by. They're waiting for both of them to come by. But now the emphasis on this as Jesus is telling it, notice he, he in this verse, we probably all know it, he continuously says the bridegroom, the bridegroom, the bridegroom, the bridegroom. He doesn't say the groom and the bride. He says the bridegroom, which is a reference to when the man comes back and he's coming back through, that he's going back to his house, which means he's come and he's about to go back. So with this, it says, And five of the virgins, they were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and they took no oil with them. I notice this caught my attention. They took no oil. So they've got their lamp. They've got that part down, which we could say for us, so if we break this down already, virgins is somebody that has, been, has not been touched by the world, somebody that's pure. Well, who does that represent now for us? That represents the Christians. Because if you're born, you're born into sin. That means you're not pure. But if you're born of God, which means you've gotten salvation, all your sins are wiped away. That makes you pure because you got, you know, Jesus is coming back for a glorious church, a spotless church. One without wrinkle or blemish. That means it's pure. So that means that we as the, the body of Christ, we're to be pure. So all of these virgins are pure. So notice all ten of them. All ten of them are pure. That means they're all, in our vernacular, they're all born again. They're all believers in God. Now, they all have their lamp. Which means they're ready to burn for God. They're ready to shine that light for anybody and everybody that comes by. They're ready to be a light in the darkness. But notice... The foolish had no oil. Now the oil is represented by the Holy Spirit. So that means you could say, well, you know, it would be kind of foolish for them to come out and to stand in the dark and not have any oil, not have any Holy Spirit, as we would say. So they're not going to burn for anything. But as we look at the next verse, it says, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So I notice if we put these two verses together, we know the one says they had no oil for the foolish and the wise had oil in their vessels with their lamps. So it almost indicates that there's oil in the lamp itself, but with the wise, they took extra in the vessel. So now, because we know that to have the lamp, you got to have oil in there to burn, but it almost reflects that the foolish didn't have oil in their vessel. They just had it in their lamp. But although we know it says no oil, but we can, you can almost see the picture painted here. It's just in their lamp. That's all they got. They have no reserve. So as they're standing there in this picture, they're standing and they've got their, their lamps and they're ready. They're ready for the, for the bridegroom to come by. It says, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, 
they all slumbered and slept. So while the bridegroom is, is, is you know, they're expecting to come back at any moment, well, all right, he, you know, bridegroom will be back any moment. Be back any moment. Be back any moment. And you can almost see them as they're, as they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. And he tarries and he delays. It's almost kind of like they say, all right, we're going we're gonna, to, let's just take a seat a moment. Let's just take a seat a moment. And so they kind of sit down and all of a sudden this, hey, he could be back at any minute. Hey, he could be back at any minute. And all of a sudden you start to see, you start to see them as they start nodding off, start to go to sleep. Because they all slumbered, which means to nod. Because slumbered in this, when you look, look up this word in, in the Greek, it doesn't mean that they're already asleep. It means they're nodding off. It's kind of like, oh, oh, wait a minute, oh. It says, and slept. So that not only did they nod off, because they're, I'm ready, I'm ready. Now I've had that where, especially some of our boys when they you know, are sound asleep and you're going to get up early for the next morning, and all of a sudden they're, they're like, so you ready, son? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm awake. I'm awake. Let's go. All right, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. It's like, really? You're not ready for anything. You're not ready for anything, boy. But notice this is the picture that Jesus is painting. So it almost gives the indication that especially in these last days, because that's really what he's referencing is the last day, the coming back of, of, of himself to gather up the people. That means that people were saying, oh, I'm ready. Oh, oh, oh. I'm ready. I'm ready, Jesus. Oh, I'm ready. Well, I'm not asleep right now. I'm listening to you. How, how asleep are you? How awake are you in your Christian walk with God? When we're supposed to be on watch... We're supposed to be paying attention to the things that are going on around us. We should notice every little thing and we should ever be ready. We should ever be ready. Which kind of leads into Luke chapter 12, verse 35, which is funny because Miss Tiffany read that this morning for pre service prayer and I hadn't told her what I was ministering on and didn't tell her anything. So I thought, that's like you, Lord. You get everything together for us. But Luke 12, 35 says, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. So I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. You, you don't have to turn there. You can write this down. It says, Be dressed for service or for duty and keep your lamps burning. So I'll say that again. So Luke 12, 35, New Living Translation says, Be dressed for service or for duty, for work, and keep your lamps burning. Keep your lamps burning. That means you must have a an ever flow of oil to keep it burning. Because you never know when, when, the, when the Lord's going to come back. You never know what's going to happen. So you've got to keep that, that vessel and that, and that lamp burning full of oil all the time. This is why the, it was so important for the wise to have their vessel filled with oil as a reserve. Now, if we painted this in the picture for us today, you could say the foolish, all right, they've, they've got their lamp, they're a virgin, all right, so they believe in God. They got their lamp. They're ready to burn, but they have no oil in their vessel. It's almost like saying that you've been born again, but you're not ready for anything else that comes by. You're not ready for anything. You haven't matured to think, All right, I need more of God. I need more of God in my walk. I need more of God. I need more of the oil. I need more of the Holy Spirit in my life to get me past this moment of salvation that I can burn forever. I can ever burn bright. To keep my lamp burning forever. But the wise, when they came, they had oil in their vessel. Now, we could paint that picture really quick. Oil in their vessel. Because what is this? This is a vessel. You have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. And when you baptize in the Holy Spirit, then you have the Spirit over you and in you. So you are ready with that oil to burn hot for God. But verse 5 again, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. But verse 6, at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye, go ye out to meet him. Now, we've been hearing for years. We've been hearing for years. Well, the Lord could come back at any time. Well, the Lord can come back at any time. The Lord come back at any time. And we've also heard, well, I've heard he's been coming back all my life and I ain't seen him yet. I've heard he's coming back all my life and I ain't seen him yet. 
That's kind of like that cry that goes out. The Lord's coming back. Lord's coming back. Lord's coming back. Be ready. Get up. Be ready. But how many people will hear that? Now, <laughs> let me take a side trail for a moment. I know one person that has like 20 alarms set for every morning. 20 alarms to get up, to be on time. Now, we, and we, we find that funny. That, that person doesn't find it funny because it takes 20 alarms to get up. But how many alarms have I given from the Word of God, but yet everybody's still asleep? How many messages of God have you heard throughout your life, but yet you're still spiritually asleep? So the, the sound, the cry goes out. Notice it's a cry. It's not just an alarm. It's a cry. It's a cry of saying, He's coming. Behold, He's coming. Get ready. And notice verse 7. Then all, not five wise, not the five foolish, all, that means all ten. Then all those virgins arose. They all got up. They got ready. And they all trimmed their lamps. Now, the trimmed means to arrange, to prepare. Of course, we know from if you use the actual lamp, you trim the wick so that way it burns brighter, it burns better, it burns, you know, uh, burns a lot cleaner, a lot better because you're trimming the excess off, you're trimming all of the, the old stuff off of it so that way your lamp burns brighter and it's, and it's ready. But you're organizing, you're preparing it. That is... As I've heard one minister say, that is how we should live our lives. We should be trimming our wick, cutting out all of the, of the old stuff, coming out all, cutting out all the things in our life that we can burn brighter, we can burn, we can burn hotter for God. But they, notice they all trim their lamps, every one of them, the foolish and the wise. But notice verse 8, And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil. For our lamps are gone out. They're going out. That means they're lacking the oil to, to, to sustain their burning for God. They're, they're lacking their oil. They're lacking the Holy Spirit, we would say now. They're lacking that to burn for their, their essence for God. Well, how, what does that mean for us? If you're not walking with the Holy Spirit, you're going to burn out in these last days. You will not survive. You will not make it. You must walk with the Holy Spirit, you must walk with God, have a current relationship with Him, ever walking with Him. Constantly walking. You know what the Holy Spirit's going to do? Every time you take a step, every, every few steps, well, I'll give you a little bit of grace. Every step that we take with the Holy Spirit, He's going to say, get rid of that. Trim this part of your wick. All right? Trim this part of your wick. All right? Trim this part of your wick. All right? That doesn't mean that you get to keep your wick and just continuously burn and make it make the you know start smoke start puffing out of there and you start burning dimmer. You can't do that. You must be trimming your wick and you must be getting things in order and being prepared, but you also must walk with the Holy Spirit to have that oil constantly being refreshed, being poured in constantly, constantly. That's why it's so important for this year to be a year of change for us to when, when God speaks, we're not having to trim our wick and say, all right, hang on, let me get up. Let me stand up. Let me finally get awake. Let me rub my eyes. Let me trim my wick. Let me get everything together. Because by then it's too late. Because we know, we all know the parable, but as we finish out here, it says, and the foolish said unto them, give us of your oil. For our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. We could paraphrase this in saying, you're not, you're not going on my Christianity. You've got to have your own oil. Mom and daddy can't get you into heaven. Aunt and uncle can't get you to heaven. Grandma and grandpa can't get you into heaven. Just like a son or daughter can't get a mom and daddy into heaven. Everybody must have their own oil. You must have your own lamp burning for God. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Now notice, they didn't say, well, go down here at this street, and you take a right, take a right, and then you find the, the second house on the left. They'll sell you some. Notice all they said was, go to where you can buy some. So that means the virgins, these, four, these five foolish, knew where to get it. They knew where to go. 
but they just chose not to. They chose to say, well, maybe we'll get it from them. Maybe we'll get it from these guys. You can't do that. You've got to go get your own. That's much like, let us I mean, just be real with you for a moment. Sitting in here today, hearing this message, there will be some that take this, they'll trim their wick, they'll burn hot for God, they'll, get, they'll start walking with the Holy Spirit even closer and tighter, and they'll, they'll do things with their Christianity and do things with their walk with God. And there'll be others that will hear this same message, not do anything, not trim their wick, not walk with the Holy Spirit, and they'll be the five foolish. But the same message is going out to each and every person. But the same goes for these because they knew where to get it. They knew how to obtain it, but they chose not to. And verse 10 says, And while they went to buy, they said, All right, finally, all right, we, we, we're going to have to give in. We're going to have to go get this. We're going to have to go get it for ourselves. The bridegroom came while they were away. And they that were ready, they that were ready, went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. These last days are not the days to play games with God. These are the, this is the year of change where we must say, Father, whatever you want changed in me, I'm ready to give it to you. Whatever you want changed, change in me, Father. Show me, and I'll be what you want me to be. You tell me what you want me to lay aside, I'll lay it aside. Father, you tell me what you want me to do for you, I'll do it for you. Because once He comes back in the air for the rapture, that's it. Where a tree falls, that's where it's going to lie. It depends on how you live today, how you live from this moment forward as to where you stand when that door is shut. Now, praise God, maybe you can have some redemption. It won't be pleasant for you after the rapture to stay here, but you can maybe have some redemption to cry out unto God. You'll have to suffer some things, but to cry out unto God and maybe make it right. But I'd rather go on the first train out of here. I'd rather not take any chances of saying maybe that door opened again where I get to go in. No, you want to be on the first train. You don't want to wait for the B train. You want to be on the A train. Hmm. Verse 11, Afterward came also the other virgins. So now they went and they bought their stuff. They got everything together. They finally got their act together. I'll say it like a pastoral way. They finally got their act together. And they came back. Afterward, they came also, the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. So now it's like they're knocking on the door. Lord, Lord, open to us. Open to us. You can almost see the same picture in Noah's day when they began to beat on the door. Noah, Noah, open the door. Open the door. I can't. The Lord closed the door. I can't open it. It's going to be that same situation. Because as Jesus even said, as the days of Noah... The door closing, people is going to be banging on it. And the days of Lot, what happened there? You had a door that was closed because they wanted to have sex with angels because they were so perverted, but yet they beat on the door trying to get in. You got closed doors in both of those scenarios, and Jesus is painting the same picture here. Once that door is shut, you're not allowed in. But notice, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Which reflects Matthew 7, 21 through 23. You can write that down. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. It essentially says, And and there will be many in that day who will say, Didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? And and the Lord's going to look at him and say, I don't know you. Now, I think that's even more damning in a way, because you said, Lord, I did all these things for you. I did all these things. I cast out demons. I've done this for you. I've done that for you. But the Lord says, I don't even know you. You know, like these virgins here, they could say, well, we had our lamp. We, you know, we, we tried to, you know, for us, I relied on my salvation. I relied on this, but I quit walking with God. I quit allowing the oil to have entrance into my life. So if we go back to the other one, well, they're, they're, you know, Matthew 7, when they're doing things for God, just because they do things for God does not mean that they, get, they know Jesus Christ. Much like the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they've done multiple things for God. They've done everything right. They, they tithe on their, 
They tied on their cumin. They tied on their, their spices, their mints. They tied on everything, done everything on the outside correctly. But yet their heart did not know God. That shows us that religiosity means nothing. You can have the proper look on the outside, make it to church where every time the door is open, do all these things. But if you're not walking with God, you're missing the whole point. But I will say, if you are walking with God, you will be there when the church doors are open. You will be crying out to God in prayer. You'll be in the Bible because you want more of Him and less of your flesh and less of the things of you, less things of the world. You want more of Him. So we got to check our motives. It doesn't matter what, how we distill anything in the Bible. It all boils down to the heart. Tithe and offering. God wants the heart, not the, not the gift. Service for God. You could do all the right things, but God wants your heart. It, when it all boils down to it, it is all about your heart loving God and wanting Him. Amen. Verse 13. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So if, if we aim to be these five wise virgins, if we aim to be like them, that means we're to always be spiritually ready. Always have the oil. Always have the oil in our lamp. Always have the oil in a vessel. The way we can refill that, keep it constantly going, constantly moving. So we're to be spiritually ready. So let's look at Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Some very familiar scripture. I'm going to start at verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, now we would say of the way, because that's, that was the name of Christianity when it first began, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So that was kind of their name, was the way. So if, if he found any man of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Now notice, this is Saul, who eventually comes the Apostle Paul. But notice his religiosity, because he's not serving Jesus Christ. He's not serving God in the way that he should. But notice the first thing he wants to do is bind people. Religiosity will bind you. It will persecute the ones that truly believe. So you got to check yourself. All right, well, maybe I, maybe I don't agree with that preacher. Maybe I just really don't, I don't agree with what he said. I don't really like him. Why? Is it because the preacher is confronting your sin? Is it because he's bringing something up that's a sore spot for you? Something to think about. Something to think about for anybody that you don't like or, some, or anything that you don't like. Why don't I like this? Why don't I like this person? You know, especially if a lot of other people like that person and you don't. Got to stop and wonder what's, hmm, what's the what's the factor in this scenario that makes me not like them? Maybe they convict you. Maybe there's something in them that rubs you wrong because you know that you need to work on something in your life, but yet they stand for that thing and it irritates you because they're that living example of that in front of you. Just something to think about. Amen. Verse three. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And notice there's a light. There's always a light when it comes to God, because there's no darkness in him. There's no darkness at all. There's always going to be a light with God. So if you're a dimwick, you might want to get some God in your life to become brighter. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Verse 4, And he fell to the earth... And heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So this is Jesus Christ speaking. He's saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me and my people? Why are you coming against me? So we could say that religiosity persecutes the true and living God. 
Religiosity persecutes those that are truly serving God because he's going after the people that, that believe in Jesus Christ. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? Oh, wait a minute now. You mean to tell me this is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is speaking to him and he doesn't know who it is? That's dangerous ground right there. We say, well, he's not part of Jesus' sheep yet, but he, de but he declares that he's a man of God. Because he's going and doing all of these things. He's going and, and slaughtering people, threatening them and binding them and bringing them to jail, all in the name of God. So it makes us, it should cause us to pause and say, what are we doing for God? What do we declare that we're doing for God that we really shouldn't be doing? Because we can make anything look good. We can declare, you know, <laughs> you can declare, you know, we can bring Kool-Aid and I can declare, all right, God wants us all to drink this Kool-Aid. We've heard that before. That didn't turn out so well, but it was done in the name of God. So you got to check what you're doing and why you're doing it. And is it really God? <laughs> and the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks or the goads. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Now I want you to notice. This man was so religious. He's killing people. He's threatening people. He's putting people in jail. But yet when God, when Jesus Christ speaks to him, he humbles himself and says, Lord, what would you have me to do? So now, if we can say that Saul was a murderer and somebody that was you know, really desiring to throw people in jail for serving Jesus Christ and was not worthy to carry the name of a Christian... But yet Jesus called out to him and he answered and said, whatever you want me to do, Lord, then what's our excuse? Because last time I checked, I don't think anybody in here is a murderer. At least I hope not. You're hiding it pretty well if you did. Hmm. Or anything else that we've done in our life that we, can, you know, we can't say, well, God will never forgive me. This man killed Christians, God's own people, and yet Jesus still called out to him to, to have him be born again, to have him be to write most of the New Testament for us. So we should say, Lord, whatever you want me to do. Lord, I don't want to be religious. I just want to do what you want me to do. And he says, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, arise. He didn't say, all right, I want you to draw back. I want you to, to, to go back into perdition. I want you to go back to the way that you were living. I want you to continue in this. I want you to not to do this, not to do that. And he said, but, but arise. Get up. Get up. And go into the city. And it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Now notice, the light of God comes upon him. He falls down. He cries. He has this interaction with Jesus Christ. And as soon as he gets up, he can't see anything. Now it's not because the light was so bright, but as we're about to find out, there's something else that is covering his eyes. Let's go down to verse 17. Let me give you a little backstory. What we're kind of skipping just for time's sake is this man Ananias, he hears the Lord speaks to him to tell him to go meet Saul and to, to lead him pretty much to Jesus Christ, lead him through what he needs to do to become born again, we'll say, for our vernacular but kind of leading him into, he's wanting to bring him into the, to the fold of being a Christian and no longer a persecutor of Christians. Verse 17, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hand on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, hath appeared unto thee in the way as thou hast comest. 
has he has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. So I notice this man that's called by God says, the Lord has sent me to you. Who all has the Lord sent in your life? To not only just to be that, that one that puts a hand on their shoulder and says, Brother Saul, but the one that says, He has sent me that you might receive your sight and it might be filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a good pastor. I'm not saying that to build myself up. I'm saying even myself, to, to remind my flesh and myself, that's why I have a pastor, is for the Word of God to be put into me by, by my man of God and for me to be continuously fed the oil that I need by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Ghost. Verse 18, And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Now, huh. Scales. Scales have been on his eyes. These scales are not like fish scales or anything like that. This is scales like dried up flesh, dried up skin that was covering his eyes. So notice when the light of God hits him and he has this interaction with God, has this interaction with Jesus Christ, then all of a sudden when he goes to see, when he goes to open his eyes, he can't because he's blinded by his flesh. He's blinded by the things that is, and now notice it's scales, so it's old flesh. It's not like skin, like, like nice smooth skin that's still alive. It's scales as it's covered his eyes from like dead flesh. Things that are dead, dead works, we could say. By the religiosity that is covering his eyes. But when this man of God touched him and prayed for him, it says immediately there fell from his eyes these scales, that flesh was taken off where he could see anew. He could see again. He could see with almost, we could say new eyes, that he could see the purpose and the things. He had a new purpose. He was changed because he said, I'm no longer going to live that religiosity lifestyle. I'm going to do what God has told me to do, and I'm going to do that to the fullest of my ability. But it says, and, we, and when he received his sight forthwith immediately, or at once, and he arose. So when, as soon as he got in sight, he got up and went and, be, and went and was baptized. He didn't wait around and say, well, I think I'll sit here a few minutes. No, he got up. As soon as that stuff fell from his eyes, he got up and went and did. But he was also baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Now I will say, John 4, 34, Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Now we could we know in probably in context he's sitting there he's he hasn't eaten and drank drunk anything for three days so we know he's probably taking in natural food but when we apply this to a spiritual aspect when he is strengthened by the, what he has been told to do by God that's where he gains his strength you will not find any more in, uh, power and authority than when you're doing what God has told you to do. There's been times where God's told me to do something and I didn't do it right then. And I felt so weak, I felt so sick, I felt so miserable. I'm just like, I don't know if I can do this, I don't know of any of this. And that starts coming up, all these excuses start coming up with all of these things in my, in my mind, in my heart that was, made me feel so weak and insecure. But it was because I wasn't doing what God had told me to do to get that strength and that nourishment. So I, I began to realize, as soon as God tells me to do something, I need to do it right then. Or I need to do it at its appropriate time. Let's, let's clarify that. So, but it's, it's doing what God has told us to do. That's what gives us that meat. That's what gives us that nourishment and that strength. We could even apply this to the five wise virgins. Their meat was to have the oil with them, that wisdom from God. And knowing that they need to have that with them, so they had supply. They had what they had need of. But with this, we can say, let me give you another verse from John. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 27, if you want to write that down, says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. Notice it comes from Jesus Christ. For him hath God the Father sealed. So now notice if we are looking for that spiritual meat, that spiritual, spiritual nourishment, we must come from God. It must come from him to receive that, that meat that we have need of. Then Saul 
Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ into the synagogues, in the synagogues, excuse me, that he is the Son of God. So notice we have this religious man who's killing Christians now going into the same synagogues and preaching that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's preaching exactly what he was going against. We know that God wants us to change anything that is out of line with Him. So I guess if I had a title or text or whatever you want to say it for this message, it would be Christians cannot stay the same. Christians cannot stay the same. That's why I feel this is important, especially for maybe this service that is our first one of 2022. We've been called to arms for the things of God, and we're not to stay the same. We're to change. We're to look more like Christ. We're to be more God-like. Not that we'll have it perfect and have it all figured out, but that we walk with God, that we do figure those things out. We do know exactly what to trim our wick with. We know what to get out of our life and how to burn brighter for God. So last verse. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would, not ha- I would not that ye should be ignorant. I don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be ignorant as in you don't understand this. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did eat all eat the same spiritual meat. Now there's that, there's that again. They had spiritual food. They all had the same food. They all had the spiritual. Like, like right now, all of you are receiving the same spiritual meat of this message. Verse 4. And, all, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But, uh-oh. Nah, that's, never, that's not a good thing. When everything's going good and all of a sudden you hear a but, that's not a good thing. The only time a but is good is if everything's negative and then all of a sudden you see a but and it brings a positive. This is not that case. This is the opposite of that. But with many of them, notice the word many. As my Bible has a footnote of saying, but with most of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown... They were strewn in the wilderness. Now, why were they strewn in the wilderness? Because they didn't allow God to change them the way that they, He wanted to change them. This is the same people as, as we are talking about here, the, the children of Israel, you know, especially when they, when they come through the Red Sea, as we've preached recently. They come through the Red Sea, seen all these miracles, but yet the first sign of trouble, what they do? They took everything that was whispering in their ear, all those golden earrings, and made their own idol out of it. That's exactly what they did. The first opportunity they got, the first thing that came up, they betrayed God. So in other words, they really didn't change. All they done was traded the God that was, treating, that was taking care of them to when all of a sudden trouble come up. They said, alright, well Moses is not around. We don't see God. So now we need to find something that we can look at to declare as our God. So the heart didn't change. But I notice, even in this, when when Paul is saying this, he says, but with many of them, or most of them, God was not well pleased. That means there were a remnant that he was pleased with. Who was that? The ones that stood by God and said, God, we serve you no matter what. We serve you no matter what. We're going to go with you on this mountain. We're going to follow you wherever you go. We're going to be led by you. We're going to be determined to serve you. Because (coughs) Joshua was one of those. And what did he say? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He was determined. He allowed God to be God of his life and not just the thing that he painted for everybody to see. He was determined because he allowed God to change him. And that set him up to be the next leader, which gained many battles, which won many battles for the children of Israel. 
and also led them to their promised land, as we've also recently preached. So my question for us this morning is, is are you willing to change? Honey, I think that kind of sounds like a message I preached last Sunday. So this is the time for us to really seek God, to allow Him to change us. Because we should not be the same. And for the Lord to lay this on my heart kind of two weeks in a row, that means that we need to be changing and we need to be changing quick. Because that means that He's saying this is important. Because it's kind of like that, you know, when, when you know, the Lord said, Saul, Saul, as I've learned from my pastor, anytime God says your name twice, it's not good for you. It is not good for you. If He's saying your name twice, you're in trouble. It's kind of like for us, it would be kind of like the middle name. Like when, when Miss Tiffany or I say our boys' is first and middle name, they, are, they already they start puckering up. I'm in trouble now. Except for Zach. Zachariah Alon? Hi, Mom and Daddy. He tries to pour on the charm because he knows he's in trouble, so he kind of tries to pour that out. Boy, I'm not doing that. Yes, sir. Then he puckers up. When he says he's going to get anywhere with that, then he puckers up. Anyway. <laughs> May we realize that we need to let God change us to shape and mold us into what He wants us to be. Because, I mean, after all, He created us. He had a vision and a plan for us before we even formed in our mother's wombs. So why not allow Him to lead us into what that really is? Why would we settle for a second-class <laughs> destiny? Amen. Now, I can't take credit for that. My pastor said that. Because, see, I listen to my pastor, so I can quote my pastor all day long. Amen. But we must allow God to change us, to shape us and mold us. Amen.